everybody. Welcome to episode 327 of The Virtual Couch, and also at the same time, episode 37 of Waking Up the Narcissism. I'm doing something that I've never done before. I am going to post this same episode and release it at the same time to both of my podcasts. Why? Well, that is because my guest today has three of the top 10 episodes in terms of overall downloads of the 326 Virtual Couch episodes that I have done over the past five years. And I would love for my Waking Up the Narcissism audience, which I, I have the numbers now showing that it is a different audience, which is uh, absolutely fascinating. And I would love for them to get to know the guest, uh, Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife today as well. And it's because Jennifer truly has a gift of explaining things and explaining the human condition in a way that I feel like most people can relate to. And in today's episode, we talk about so many things. We talk about love versus control. We talk about whether or not we are honestly looking for intimacy in a relationship or what, or whether we are seeking validation and how so often because of the way that we were raised or the modeling that we saw early in our lives, we do we even know what healthy relationships look like. And on that note, how does one get on that path of knowing what you don't know? Because how do you know what you don't know? Kind of deep, right? But we also, we do, we touch on narcissism, we touch on emotional immaturity, we touch on what that looks like maturing out of a narcissistic view of the world and what that can take. So we just hit on so many different things. And one of my favorite things to do is getting Dr. Jennifer to laugh a couple of times as well, because she is, I feel like she is a very funny person, very real person, but man, she can just get in this zone where she just has so much knowledge. And this is maybe a little plug to go check out the YouTube video. And while you're there, of course, I would love for you to hit the subscribe button. But there are a couple of times where she's she's looking down, you can tell that she's kind of in the zone. And then I can't help myself. I love humor. And maybe something comes out and then she looks up, uh, makes eye contact with the camera and laughs. It's one of my favorite things in the world. But for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife, this is from her website. Um, which I will link to in the show notes, but she is a relationship and sexuality educator and coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in Illinois with a PhD in counseling psychology from Boston College. She wrote her dissertation on LDS women and sexuality, and she has taught college level courses on human sexuality. She currently teaches online courses and live workshops to individuals and couples seeking to develop their capacity for a deeper emotional and sexual intimacy. And additionally, she offers limited private and group coaching services to individuals and couples who have benefited from her podcast and courses and are looking for more direct input on improving their lives and relationships. And while I have had her on before, as I mentioned, I've been especially impressed with her subscription-based podcast, Room for Two, where Dr. Jennifer coaches couples in real time. And as a full practicing, as a full-time practicing therapist who has now worked with well over a thousand couples myself, and I share this with Jennifer on the podcast, listening to her work with couples, listening to that real-time coaching, has absolutely helped me in my couple's work. So again, this interview is available on YouTube. You can just search for Virtual Couch there and I could go on, but I wanna to get to the interview. So quickly, let me run through a little bit of business. I have my own marriage workshop that is available at tonyoverbay.com slash workshop. And this is not my magnetic marriage course, but this is roughly a 90 minute $19 workshop with a full money back guarantee where I simply lay out the basics on why we don't know what we don't know when we come into a relationship or into a marriage. And I give you some tools of how you can instantly improve your marriage. But I feel like it's really, really a good, as we call in the business, psychoeducational view on why we don't know what we don't know. And that is OK. And on that note, my associate, Nate Christensen, who has been on both podcasts, Waking Up to Narcissism, where he talked about the neurology or neurobiology of narcissism, as well as several virtual couch episodes. He, he and his wife have an amazing podcast that they recently launched called Working Change, which is part of my virtual couch podcast network. And I highly recommend you go listen to that, subscribe to it, where so he and his wife, who is pursuing, she's pursuing her master's degree in counseling as well, and is on the road to becoming a licensed therapist, licensed counselor. They cover a lot of topics, including blended families, anxiety, depression, all things mental health, so much more. But Nate and I are in the final planning stages of filming an anxiety workshop. So if you want to know more about that, the easiest way is to go to TonyOverbay.com and simply sign up for the newsletter if you want to learn more, and I will let you know as soon as that is available. All right. So without any further ado, let me get to my interview with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Okay. All right. Action. Can I tell you a funny thing? I'm in an office where it's me and a bunch of divorce attorneys. And I feel like there's a joke there, a group on and right out of my door, I've got an inner waiting room and they bring the people there to sign papers. I think it's because the conference room is full. So I have a couple right out of my door right now that 
are they're I'm getting into divorce it. papers. Yeah. Oh, they're fighting. They're they're fighting. Yeah. Yeah, so should, I was uh, there was a part of me that thought, okay, should we just open the door and let's give them you know, the, <laughs> two, two, two amazing two therapists? Yeah, here. yeah. And I can say, all right, Jennifer, let's see what you got. This will be fun. Yeah, but that's a good that's a good uh, segue, though. I I really am enjoying your room for two podcast. What's that like for Great. you? Great, I've liked it. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's been fun to do actually. So it's interesting to hear how much people value it, or like how it gives them the chance to think about themselves without yeah. being in the actual discomfort of an office and in conflict. So it, yeah. it gives them just a, a sideways look and then they can <clears throat> think about, Oh yeah, I do that. And it's easier somehow for our brain to process, you know, I'm actually preparing a lesson for Sunday on David and Bathsheba and how the prophet okay. Nathan comes to David <laughs> And says, oh, there's this guy that did this terrible thing. And David's like, oh, yeah, lose, loser, get rid of him. <laughs> and of course, it's him. Okay. And that's oh. so much who we are as humans. We have a hard time recognizing our own difficult behaviors. And this is just a way to help people see themselves through other people's stories, hopefully. I love that's it. I, they're, boy, there are so many things there that I think would be fun to talk about. One of those is I did an episode at one point on gossip and I talked about mm -hmm. how I found some data that talked about how we communicate through gossip, exactly what you're saying of, Hey, what do you think about that guy? And then if they say, right. I, I know, right. Then I feel like, Oh yeah, yeah. He's crazy. But if they said, well, I feel like he, he had every right to do that. Then I'm like, yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, you know, totally, and we're, right? I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're ju judging of the, so we don't have to talk about the elephant in the room. Can I tell you a, yeah. a funny thing for me? So I, I like to talk often about the, the concept of psychological reactance, the instant negative reaction of being told what to do. And I had had mm. several of my clients suggest to me that I listen to room for two. And so uh -huh. I found myself saying, I will not be listening to Room for Two. And then I, and then I thought, why? And Jennifer is my top three most downloaded episodes ever. And I'm a therapist. It would be nice to hear. And then I realized that was my fear was, well, what if, what if I'm like a really crummy therapist? You know? And, uh, and so I yeah, want you yeah. to know that I, you have helped me a ton as well. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, and I've been able to do all kinds of self-confrontation. But yeah, I'm curious though, it, do you feel like there is a difference between therapy and coaching? I'm so curious about your opinion on this. Well, the only thing that's really different for me is I'm not treating... Well, two things. I'm not treating mental health issues. So I'm okay. not yeah. treating depression, anxiety, psychopathology. And if I work with somebody and that's emerging, then I am saying, you know, go and, and find a counselor for this specific thing. So yeah. I, uh, so that's the difference. I'm making a mental health versus a developmental self-awareness distinction. Mm. Um, and then I also don't do long-term work with people. I do short-term consultation so I'm often yeah. where people are often stuck is that they can't see what they can't see. They can't see yeah. their participation in their troubles. Yeah. And I think one of my skills is being able to see better how this couple is interacting and reinforcing the worst in each other. Mm -hmm. And when we're just aware of what our partner does, which is what we're usually most acutely aware of, yeah. we become unable to get out of the pattern. Yeah. And so I'm trying to offer that third view to help people's intelligence go up and allow them to engage differently. So I'm not doing kind of long-term handholding. I'm more trying mm -hmm. to wake people up to themselves. They may go get a counselor to do that longer term work, yeah. especially if they're staying on the right muscle, right? That can mm -hmm. be very valuable. It's easy in therapy though, especially in individual therapy, to pull for the therapist to buy into your self-deceived picture Absolutely. Yeah. and then just get reinforcement for that picture rather than staying on our liabilities or our limitations. So, yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I like what you're saying there too. I find that when someone is not aware of what they are not aware and then if yeah. I just have empathy and I just say, man, that sounds hard. I realize they walk out of the office and say, Okay, he agrees. And, and it's, oh, right. not, it's not agreeing, but they're so used to, I feel like the people telling them they're wrong, that then just saying, man, that sounds difficult. I guess that must feel like, oh, that, that felt validated. Yeah, they, right. Yeah. The, right, exactly. And I think it, you can validate the difficulty of a position. Exactly. Without making people think that it's 
the justified decision or a better way yeah. of saying it, or that it's going to give them what they ultimately want. I think a lot of times I'm trying to be Christmas future for people and wow. say, yeah. if you keep yeah. doing this, right, as good as it may feel or as justified as it may feel, you're going to have a son who doesn't trust you or take you seriously, mm -hmm. or you're going to have a spouse who may manage you, but doesn't want to be close to you. So I'm trying to help people see in our self-deception, we can justify ourselves but not yeah. recognize we're destroying our own happiness. Yeah. Hey, do you prefer one versus the other of doing a little more of that long-term therapy versus the coaching and seeing Christmas future? I love that concept. I mean, I probably like both actually on some level. There are some people in my practice that I have worked with longer term, especially if mm -hmm. I think it's productive and they're really working through things. Mm -hmm. But I probably honestly prefer the shorter term work in part because people work harder if they think that as long as they can afford it, they can just have me on tap in a sense. Right. Yeah. It allows the delusion that people just need more information as yeah. opposed to going out and doing the hard work of changing behavior. Yeah. So self-awareness is only valuable in as much as it helps us to act differently, but it's in acting differently that we change our lives. And so okay. I never want to use the frame of coaching or therapy to interfere with people actually doing differently because mm -hmm. it's a it's a tempting idea that someday I'll feel like doing this hard thing. Yeah. I was just absolutely. talking to somebody who can be quite, quite mean to her husband and get him to do things that she wants. And, and she knows that what she's doing is wrong. She knows it's destructive, meaning she's becoming, she's seeing herself and seeing that she's repeating what one of her parents did. But to actually go and tell her husband, look, I use your desire to have me be happy with you to take advantage mm -hmm. of you. That's very mm -hmm. different. Like it's one thing to talk to me about it, to go and actually expose it to him and say, I'm a jerk. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, I'm not fair to you. Well, that takes a lot more courage and yes. most of us would rather just sit and talk about our, how bad we are or how we could do better or than actually going and doing better. I agree. And, or the old, well, I will do it later. I'll do it when yeah. I'll do it when I have more time. I'll do it when the kids are out of school. I'll do it when he's in a better mood or I don't want to confront exactly. him around his birthday or Arbor day or whatever. Right. Or whatever. Right. right. <laughs> I pulled that one out. Um, yeah, that was uh, Arbor Day. <laughs> no, it's, it's a lot of people don't understand the fears people have around Arbor Day. Um, yes. you know, I do feel like the, what I like about listening to you coach, and I'm starting to use a lot of your vernacular, so I hope that mm. it, it isn't trademarked. Mm. I've been talking about a lot about the courage mm. and caretaking, yeah. so I appreciate that. And I also feel like I remember early in grad school, a professor saying that you're going to get to a point where you really do feel like you just want to say, Hey, here's what you need to do, but right. you know that that's probably not the most therapeutic thing, but mm -hmm. do you feel like that's a place you're at now where I would love to s help them skip steps if possible, even knowing that they still have to do the work? Well, I, yes and no. Uh, yeah. On the one hand, I do think that a strength of what I do is I am helping people see things differently. So I yeah. am literally trying to help people actually see their problems from a different vantage point. Yeah. Because I think it helps them to do something about it. A lot of times people are in a meaning frame that try as they might, they cannot solve it because the meaning frame keeps them trapped. Mm -hmm. So that is, I'm going to, you know, have my spouse make me feel good about myself or I'm going to get, hang on a second. No um, yeah, I'm going to get my partner to validate me and make me feel good about myself. Well, I think that's a meaning frame that's in many therapies that is never going to solve your problem because the locus of control is outside of you. Yeah. So yes, on the one hand, I am kind of saying to people, you have to wake up to what's actually true here. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. direct and directive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think where I am maybe doing the opposite more is that I sometimes would want to rush in and be like, well, answer like this. Let's do okay. a role play. Yes. This is how you should say it. You know, we're more like I'm just trying to download a kind of a way of doing it, thinking that this is just about modeling. Yeah. When in fact, 
I think I'm more effective the more I actually understand where someone is and realize that's outside of their capacity. They cannot do that yet. And to talk to them as if they can is only going to make them feel bad. It's only going to make them feel ineffectual. Yeah. So what's well, the right amount of pressure that they can actually do? And so I'm trying to be a little more in tune with who the person is right in front of me and what they're actually capable of internalizing and making sense of. I love that. I love that because I know that you talk a lot about external validation and I really, I so appreciate, I often say that if you're looking for external validation, I, there's a very low, low chance the person will say or do the right thing. And then you get mm. to say, they don't care about me and I'm a piece of garbage. Right. And then, but I like what you're saying. Cause I feel like at times I'm now more aware of that. The person in front of me, I think is trying to say the things to get me to react and let them and tell them, Hey, you're doing a great job. They want yeah. the external validation from me. And exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, and yeah. So that's hard. Yeah. And so I think to be effective as a change agent or to help people get better, it's quite a tricky process because you have to know what better is which is in and of itself challenging because it's yes. our, own depe- our own developments dependent upon that. Yeah. And then also knowing who the person is in front of you and actually seeing them as they are, not as how they are presenting themselves or as they yeah. want you to think they are. And then thinking about what is the right amount and the most effective way to pressure this person out of disequilibrium with themselves. Mm. And that's a real process, a real learning process of what's most effectual for people especially if they're like busy telling you you're doing a great job, even if you're not, that that's also, yeah. <laughs> which can yeah. happen too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to put a pin in something that you, that I just thought of that I want your opinion on. And I don't know why mm-hmm. I just gave you that preamble when I'm not going to ask the question now, but there's my train of thought. But I, the part that I think that you just brought up that I so appreciate is, man, we're going through our own things, even as therapists. That mm-hmm. we've, and I, I want to give you so much credit for and I'm guessing you know you do a lot of podcasts. The last time that we spoke, I thought I'd figured mm. everything out with this anxious and avoidant attachment, this dance of mm. the anxious avoidant attachment. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember this at all. Yeah, and yeah, I presented yeah. five minutes of just data to you that was like, I've got it figured out and here's what the guys do and I can speak to them, but can you address all womankind? And I feel like you said <laughs> something effective. You question the maturity of the relationship in general. And I want to be honest with you. I, I so admire you and I enjoy having you on. And I thought, oh, that wasn't the answer I wanted. It's funny because that caused me to take a look more at emotional maturity. And I think I've said it on a few of my podcasts and I realized it wasn't long before I said, oh, she was right. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, you you were right. And it's caused me to really look more at what that anxious attachment looks like and and from a caretaking standpoint. And, but so I appreciate the, just, I try to be as authentic or vulnerable with my clients as well, because I think that emotional immaturity in a therapist is them pretending that they do know everything. Right. Um, I don't know if exactly. you've been to that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think most of us go into the profession because there's something in the idea that we have the answers and that we can help people. Maybe we came out of that in our own families. Yeah. There's usually a reason why we're drawn to that particular role. And there's real goodness in it, right? There's often this desire to help yeah. humanity and to help the world be better. But there can also be a narcissism in it or a pretense yes. in it, like I've got it all worked out. I know how things in fact are. And when we like that view of ourselves too much, it interferes with our effectiveness, actually. And yeah. it interferes with our openness to where we are not right, you know, what we're yeah. not getting right. I have often thought maybe I'm doing a better job than I am if (laughs) a client feels like they can't tell me like that was the stupidest thing you've ever said to me that was not helpful or whatever, you know, because we often want a view of ourselves that actually keeps us from seeing what's actually true about us. Yeah, I so Mm. appreciate it. I remember one of the clients, so I did my internship working for the church and I remember I would run into people that would have experiences with other therapists and then it transferred because... And I remember this aha moment where one of the guys said, I asked the therapist about some concept about a marriage therapy principle. And I said, have you ever heard of this? Or can I give you this article? And she said, 
I'm the therapist. That isn't your role mm-hmm. to do that. And I remember the, mm-hmm. in the article that he ended up sharing, of course, then at that time, I probably just wanted his validation because I was a, mm-hmm. a brand new intern, but I read mm-hmm. it and it was amazing. And I just thought, boy, we do feel at times, or at least I don't like to think mm-hmm. I do, but how, how dare someone try to tell me I'm the one that has the, the right. master's degree and sits in front right. of you. You have the PhD. People can't tell you anything, right, Jennifer? Right. <laughs> I wish. I... <laughs> Well, that's the thing is like the paradox. <laughs> so, and you mentioned, perhaps, it, oh, right? yeah. Well, I just think the paradox is the more yeah. we acknowledge our own stupidity, the stronger and the better we yes. are. Right. And then that's not to say yes. that I'm always doing that. I resist it as much as anybody <laughs> else. I like to feel competent. I like to feel like I've got it all worked out. But the more we can actually be genuinely humble, it's a true mm. measure of our capacity. And I don't mean eating dirt humiliated kind of humble. I mean, we stay open to what we're getting wrong. Yes. We, we're open to what we don't yet understand. That's a real, that our ego is not as important as wisdom, that how yeah. we see ourselves isn't as important as doing things that are actually helpful or right. And that's, that's a real measure of moral courage, but really counter to human inclination because we like to see ourselves the way we like to see ourselves. Absolutely. And it's funny. And now I feel like I'm giving you credit for my entire uh, practice at this point. But <laughs> in that same episode, uh, we talked about somebody that was a fan of both you and I, and they had talked about fitting some version of uh, me talking about narcissism and you talking about oh, yeah. um, differentiation. Right. And then mm-hmm. and you had just made a comment where you said, well, we all have a little, I think, right. Yes, you feel uh-huh. like you said, we all have some uh, narcissistic We're all a little traits narcissistic or, or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And I, and I remember thinking, I remember thinking, Oh, how dare you? I mean, I mean, not me. I mean, although, <laughs> although I was right. Although I was, I would always think that I was being clever by talking about my narcissistic traits or tendencies. And then I start up this yeah. separate podcast, waking up to narcissism because I just felt like there was such a demand. And I work with a heavy population of people that are in yeah. these uh, relationships with emotionally immature people. I used to say yeah. people yeah. with heavy narcissistic traits or tendencies. And, and you were in my head there too. And about nine episodes in, I did a episode saying, am I the narcissist? And I mm, talked about, excellent. look, and I talked about looking at it from an emotional immature lens and that true narcissistic personality disorder is such a small percentage of the population, That's right. but we talk about it so often. And that I have to tell you, Jennifer, that was a game changer because it gave, mm. uh, it gave language for both sides of the street to be able to say, okay, here's how I show up a little more emotionally immature. And it was just, yes. It was so nice. Right? I mean, it doesn't yes. mean that it's solved everything, but I think it's been able to provide a framework for better well, the, communication. That's that's great. And I think the more we wake up to ourselves genuinely mm-hmm. and deal with ourselves, the more capable of intimacy we are. The, yes. The, the better it is to be with us. Like if your partner is deluded about who they are, yeah. they're not safe to be with. If you're deluded about your own narcissism or whatever, you interfere with people wanting to be close to you because it's costly to be. So Mm -hmm. this self-awareness is a big deal. And, you know, narcissism can hide in the form of, you know, the abject demanding, I know everything, but it also can hide in the kind of martyr, covert superiority. Nobody's giving me what I'm owed because I'm over here sacrificing and nobody gets it. And that's a kind of narcissism too, that, you know, we all start out narcissistic. That's babies are highly yes. narcissistic. The question is, do we grow out of our narcissism? That's really what it is. Yeah. And some people it's so entrenched. It's a narcissistic personality disorder, but yeah. really the challenge is our egos. And do we dare to see ourselves enough to grow beyond them? I love that. And okay. Now I feel like I'm about to ask for your validation and then I want to get into the topic. I know I'd, I'd sent you or I emailed you about, I love that you said that because I now have this big soapbox where I like to say, yeah, if we start from the womb, every little kid, yeah, the baby, all their desires mm-hmm. are is that I must emote to get my needs met. And then, mm-hmm. and since they're cute and they smell nice and things, mm-hmm. then people meet all of their needs and then, yes. right. And then we move into childhood and I, I like to say, welcome to the world of abandonment. Now, if they aren't yeah. going to be the, the pony for my birthday or I don't get to eat licorice yeah. for dinner, then how dare they? I'm asking for these things. So right now I have to show up and figure out a way to get my needs met and then bring that stuff into adolescence. And now I've got that dance of uh, my attachment to how do I show up to get my needs met and my abandonment. Uh, I'm a little narcissist. So if they don't meet my needs, they must hate me. And uh, right. And it's so crazy then to think, man, when I feel like when you lay it out that way, and then of course we need external validation because we have no sense of self, but now we're supposed to step into a relationship and now we can work on this together. And, mm-hmm. and become become emotionally mature. Because I love 
where you talk about differentiation and your side mm-hmm. of the street and not needing external mm-hmm. validation. Um, mm-hmm. Where do you see that role of how to communicate? Do you feel like communicating one's needs, communicating one's wants? How do you address that? Um, the way I think about it is that communicating who we are okay, and not our needs. Our needs is this kind of idea that I have needs and you partner have to fulfill those Meet needs. Meet them. Yeah. And that just means that this isn't about love. This is about obligation. Okay. Now that's different than saying we're automatons and we have no impact on each other. Cause of course yeah. we do. Um, but intimacy is not a use model. It's a knowing mm. and being known model, which I think is a, a higher it, it's developmentally further along. Yeah. So when we're younger in our development, we think of a future partner as fulfilling our needs, making us feel loved, making us feel worthy, validating our sexuality, right? Our Mm -hmm. desirability. That's how most of us get married is in that frame of dependency because we haven't matured into someone who can accept ourselves really yet. But when I talk to couples about intimacy or communication, I'm talking to them about showing who they are. And using communication to get clearer about who they are. Mm -hmm. Not about trying to get something from the other person. Yeah. So the intimacy is unilateral in that you're showing who you are. So just in the conversation I was having, I do group coaching sometimes. And somebody was asking about the question of how, what does it even mean to be intimate? Okay. And she's somebody who wants high levels of control. So I was saying, well, it's showing your spouse who you actually are. Mm. Here's what would be an intimate statement. I'm a user. I take advantage of you. Mm. I use your discomfort with my anger to get things from you. Highly intimate conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. But it sounds like the, to someone that is used to codependency and enmeshment, is that to sound like, well, wait, I'm hanging myself out to dry or they're going to, mm. they're going to use that against me or yeah. Right. Well, that's kind of what her fear was. Well, I yeah. will lose my control over him if yeah. I reveal my trade secrets. <laughs> now, now he's, she's not married to an abusive guy. He's not going to use it to yeah. basically exploit her. Yes. She's afraid she'll lose control over him and she depends on him to manage her reality. Mm. So she doesn't want to reveal herself. So I would say she doesn't want intimacy. She wants control. Control. Yeah. So a lot of us use the framing of intimate communication to keep control of our partner Mm. much more than we're using it to reveal who we really are because who we really are is often not that great. I don't speaking against human beings. I'm talking about our own inclinations to do ego reinforcing things that aren't particularly loving, right? We're very good at doing that as human beings. Even needing to be needed is a ego reinforcing behavior that isn't necessarily about loving other people. It's about demanding love in a sense. Well, or, or it's about needing to be validated by them yeah. being dependent on you in some way. Does, Sometimes yeah. we're over functioning for the sake of our kids. And, you know, I have a child with autism and this was when he was starting his freshman year in high school. And, my husband and I were kind of concerned because he was going to catch a bus and like just worried. Was he, he had, was coming out of a school, especially for kids on the spectrum into a mm-hmm. normal uh, like school for neurotypical kids. And so we were worried and we would sort of overfunction, walk him to the mm-hmm. bus stop and do all these things. Well, one morning my husband and I both slept in and we woke up to, well, he had left a phone recording on an answer machine what we had back then and <laughs> saying something like, you know, Oh, so we woke up in a panic. He'd gotten himself out the door, caught the bus, realized that the dog was outside in the yard and wanted to make sure that we were aware of it. So called to tell us to let him in. I mean, this was like way more mature than we were expecting. And it was yeah. just this moment of awareness that we were so busy being needed that we were actually mm. interfering with his autonomy. Yes. And so sometimes when we want to see ourselves as the epicenter of our children's lives or want to see ourselves as necessary to our spouse, we operate in ways that are actually interfere because we want to, like therapists will do this, to keep somebody in a relationship with them because you want to feel so important when in fact what they actually need is more autonomy from you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and I, I've read No More Mr. Nice Guy, and I feel like mm -hmm. that was a big one for me to recognize that when somebody feels like, no, I'm so nice that I, anyone would like exactly. me, or right? right? And that's the exactly. part where, Exactly. That's okay. very much. Yeah. yeah. It's needing to be needed, that nice guy. I'm yeah. going to be the best man, and then you're going to always want to have sex with me because yeah. you're going to feel so lucky. <laughs> and that's still about ego reinforcement. It doesn't yeah. look narcissistic because it's yeah. the nice guy, but it's deeply self-preoccupied. And so it doesn't feel desirable mm -hmm. or trustworthy because there's all these covert contracts connected to it. Yeah. Can I ask you, and this was just one that I've been thinking about lately. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about if I can have someone understand that, that they don't need that external validation and they're okay they, they, as, as they are, but then if they never grew up and had that secure attachment to a parent, so now I'm telling the client that, no, you can, now you find yourself and we identify their values. I, you know, I love mm -hmm. uh, acceptance and commitment therapy and then we'll some, mm -hmm. some value-based actions and take action mm -hmm. and don't ruminate. But mm -hmm. do you find ever, first of all, I'd love your thoughts on that mm -hmm. concept of how one starts to find their self, because I almost feel like I'm noticing, okay, the person still even in doing a values exercise of almost still saying, is this the right value? What do you think? Do you think that this is what I, and so even on the path of trying to find oneself so they can internally validate mm -hmm. if they never had the model of a secure attachment, then I, I yeah. do wonder if sometimes that is asking this person to do this thing that they're saying, I, I think, am I doing this right? But then I shouldn't right. be asking you because. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, it is very, the most fortunate people, of course, came out of securely to use that language, securely yeah. attached family systems. And th what I would say is differentiated family systems. Yes. Yes. So a differentiated family is not, a lot of times people think differentiation is autonomy and attachment mm. is attachment, but differentiation is actually the ability to balance our need for autonomy and our need for connection. Yeah. So yeah. differentiation includes attachment, but also our desire to belong to our autonomy because mm. human beings want both things. Yeah. And it's our ability to balance that, be in connection without losing our independent psychological functioning that defines how differentiated we are. Mm. In a loving family, in a differentiated family, the parents can actually know the child because they can manage their sense of who they are and they don't need the child to reinforce them as important or as necessary. They're able to invest in what will facilitate that child growing into their own strength and yeah. they can facilitate what kinds of limits and privileges that child needs. So the child grows up, the, l the lucky child grows up knowing that I can both be in relationship and belong to myself and I get exactly. to have both. And so it's much easier to go and replicate a relationship. You're not going to marry somebody that's more needy than you. You're going to marry somebody who's at a similar level of capacity in terms of that ability to balance those competing demands. Yeah. Those of us that grew up in a family that was more enmeshed or psychologically entangled are going to have more confusion. Well, I say mm -hmm. they inherit a way of being in relationship. They inherit how you, how much self gets to be there and how much connection gets to be there. And so like to use the attachment lip framing, some people are overly autonomous, like avoidant, or they're overly avoidant, in, yeah. in, uh, relational, which is enmeshed, or what's the word you use? Um, anxious attachment. Anxious, uh, the anxious attachment. attachment. Exactly. Yeah. So the point is, is that in my work, what I do is I'm showing people that they are replicating a pattern mm -hmm. that's keeping them from freedom from that pattern. I like that. So even if they're going to a therapist and they're telling them how to talk to each other, they're still replicating an anxious attachment, in my opinion. Yes, I can see that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's not helping them learn how to stabilize their own functioning. Mm -hmm. Now, ideally, you got that already. Okay. So I'm to go through the first phase of life without meeting the primary needs of that first phase, it's very challenging. Mm-hmm. And, but our fantasy is that you're going to get it from a therapist or get it from a partner. And a therapist should facilitate the yeah. process the person needs to go through. But in my experience, the way that people most find their strength is by confronting their participation in a fantasy. Like mm. that my spouse is going to make me feel good, but I keep doing things in order to get that that make me feel bad. 
Yeah. And so, for example, if they can wake up to that pattern and see how it works against them and their spouse, then they have the chance. Then what happens is they're cleaning up their internal reference. Okay. And they are more able to organize their minds at a more autonomous level. Now, by autonomous, I don't mean avoidant. Right. I mean, they're more able to stabilize their sense of who they are. So, for example, if I have confronted in my own life, like, okay, I keep pressuring my child for a picture of myself as a parent that I want. Yes. That's actually burdening him and is interfering with both knowing him, being a good parent to him, but also giving him pressure to manage myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see where I learned it. I know my parent did some of that. I'm doing it too. Well, that waking up and realizing this is affecting my child and saying, I, I'm not going to do it. I, I, I have to manage my own fears. I have to manage my own expectations, my own anxieties that I'm not enough, anxieties that I inherited, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to make them my child's problem. They're yeah. my problem. Now, as unintuitive as that is, right? <laughs> you want to go make them your spouse's problem, your therapist's problem, somebody else's Absolutely. problem. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you want someone to solve it for you yeah. in the fantasy that there is a pseudo parent out there. Yeah. But there isn't when you're an adult. And so the way you do it is you say, like, I have to offer better than what, because I don't, I don't respect what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't respect it when my parents did it. I don't respect it when I do it. So I have to do better and handle myself and handle my fear and handle my disappointment. Now, that sounds very lonely. It is, it is quite alone. But the more you can metabolize and handle yourself and function differently, the more you actually go and create. So for example, with my son, during that time, I was doing things that made him want to get away from me, right? Didn't want my influence, even though I was certain that he needed it. And, you know, he did need help, but because I couldn't see my participation in the problem, I was actually creating a child that wasn't being helped and was trying to avoid me. Mm. As I self-confronted more and started being more honest in those conversations and dealing with myself better, right, you know, what happened is he became much more trusting, much more open, much more dealing with his own challenge in a better way and liked being with us more. So you actually build that secure attachment by facing yourself. And, and that's where I feel that like, the, you, you, oh, it does. And, and you've, yeah. uh, I've appreciated the way you've talked about on the Room for Two podcast, the, it's almost like you're, I feel like you're doing it right if you are having to deal with some invalidation, because that means Absolutely. that, right? And I will tell you, I've had two things I think are really fascinating. One, one of my daughters, she's, she had gotten herself in some really good shape. And she said, hey, uh, I realize now that we had, she's, and she was trying to frame it and it, to not hurt my feelings. But, but mm-hmm. I said, hey, let, I, I'm curious, you know, tell me more. But she said, the relationship that we had with going out to eat when she was growing up was probably not mm. healthy because mm. uh, it was everything celebratory was done out to eat. And, mm. uh, and I mm. so appreciated her comment. And I realized that was one of those moments where I wanted to defend myself and say, Hey, I was raised right. like a, fer- you know, a feral cat. I mean, going out to eat was like, it was <laughs> right. I'm trying amazing. To better. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But then I realized, yeah. but that was my, my experience. And then exactly. absolutely her experience was hers and she's probably yep. right. You know, yes. and, uh, yeah. And so yeah. I'm so grateful for that, but I, it almost broke my heart the way she tried to present it to me because it was from this, mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know if this is going to go well. And that's where I wanted yeah. to say, am I going to hurt my dad's feelings? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Which is fascinating. And then I have to tell you another one that this is just, I think is fascinating. I feel like my goal, I had three girls and my son is my youngest. He's 18 and he just graduated high school. And he came up to me uh, not long ago and said, he said, Oh dad, I almost forgot to tell you, I left the burner of the oven on for hours the other day. And I have to tell you, it was so funny because I, I felt like there's my job is done, you know, well done, secure attachment. Yeah. There is zero chance I would have told my parents that. And even yeah. when he told me that I wanted to say all the things so you could have, don't you know, or burn that. But I thought this is amazing that this yeah. guy could come to me and say, look yeah, what I did. That honest. It yeah, was wild. Exactly. Cause I felt like, okay, he knows that he doesn't, he, he can come to me and there is that. Well, he can be intimate of, to use that yes, language, right? Yeah. That he can show himself and say, look, oh, by the way, I made this mistake. And that he trusts you can handle it. It was crazy. It was, it was a movie that yeah, I saw okay. as a kid 
around like a, a little boy who burnt it was Avalon. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Avalon. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. and this little boy b- burned down the store, his dad's mm-hmm. store, and like devastates the family. And he went mm-hmm. and told his dad, Dad, I'm the one who did it. And you know, and it's and what the dad does is say, No, you weren't the one. It was because of an electrical thing and it wasn't you. And I think the dad actually did it to protect the son from his own self recrimination. But yeah, I just remember at the okay. time thinking that's his parent. That's a true parent, right? That, that, it really that is. the parent handles the anxiety for the benefit of the child, but the child knows that the dad can handle who he is and will show I who he it. is, flaws and all, and not break the parent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. I do. Are you familiar with Ross Rosenberg? He he wrote the book, Human Magnet Syndrome. I don't know if you're familiar. So I'm releasing an interview with him on the Narcissism Podcast in a couple of days, but he Mm. has this concept where he's trying to redefine codependency, but he calls it self-love deficit disorder. And and he mm -hmm. just talks about this core shame comes from this place of fundamentally bad, or I'm only as good as what I do for others, which then leads to this feelings of loneliness, which then leads to this almost like the withdrawal and then turning to what he calls drug of choice, which is a a narcissistic or emotionally immature lover. Mm -hmm. And then, Mm -hmm. and then becomes this selfless compulsive caretaker who then tries to control others into loving him. And uh, and then the opposite or the treatment he calls this self-love abundance. But it was something we were saying there about even with your son or what we're talking about with this, where I, and I pulled this up. He's got this self-love abundance pyramid where he says, I am lovable because I am, I don't have to work at being loved, which leads up to this, existential peace or freedom to live as an imperfect, but worthy and lovable person. But this next part is the thing I feel like you share so well, but he says, so self-love, self-respect and self-care that engenders the same from others. And and I feel like the, right. And I feel like that part where when people, they don't know what they don't know, they didn't see it modeled, they're enmeshed and codependent because they're, we are. And then, and then that differentiation and interdependence and we're two autonomous people. I feel like I can preach that all day, but I feel like I can almost yeah. watch the eyes glaze over where the, where it's the, yeah. but then we're not, but where's the part where we're, we're dependent upon each other as if that's the, the goal. Right. And it's like, yeah, so I don't think right. people, people even know afraid. what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. are afraid if we don't need each other, why would we be together? Yeah. And it's very yeah. hard for people to understand. That's actually when you really choose somebody. Yes. When you actually value someone because they matter to you and you care for them and they're an important person in your life, not because mm. you need them. That's the birthplace of yes. love actually, that you're not like using that. them anymore. And so that's really where true friendship lies is, you know, this person, I mean, we all want to be chosen, right? A lot of yeah. us will take being needed as the kind of yes. security blanket to, for the fear that we wouldn't be chosen, that we wouldn't yeah. be deemed worthy enough of being chosen. But yeah. the greatest gift is to be chosen by a partner, to know that they value you, that they want to be with you, not because they need you, but because they are grateful for you. They value who you are. They value the friendship. And you know that you have a true friend, not one you have to earn. Yeah. Uh, and I love that because I will say often when people can find this nirvana that relationships mm. aren't as difficult as one might think that they would be. Not that they are yeah, that's without, they without right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so not they're without problems, mm-hmm. but you know, yeah, you can show up as calm, confident energy and differentiated and interdependent and curious and tell me more and know that that person's yeah. view is not an attack. I love that. You know, it's yeah. funny, I, I feel like I've kept you here for so long. Do you have a little more time? Sure. Okay. So the, cause I realized the thing that I actually emailed you about and that you sent me on a journey without knowing as well is mm-hmm. I, I would love your, is there a simple way to explain the Jungian shadow self? Cause I feel like mm-hmm. the, the getting to self confrontation and I feel like I, I understand the concept, but I feel like I don't really mm-hmm. know how to speak to it or apply it. Is that a part of your Yeah. World? I mean, I haven't actually studied, well, maybe I did way back, in okay. the day, but, but I can talk about my understanding of what the shadow self is or what it is, okay. because I think it's very connected to differentiation. It's very connected yes. to becoming strong. And there's a lot of Christian concepts in my opinion that really support it. So do you mind if I go a little religious for a moment? Oh, okay. we'll go full and, religious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll even self say yeah. amen at the end, even. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Do that. Hosanna. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think that a really core part of the Christian message is this idea 
that the true birth of goodness is when we stop needing to see ourselves as good. Okay. Right. That yeah. it's the refusal to acknowledge our own capacity for evil that makes mm -hmm. us evil. Right. That makes us dangerous. And so where Christ was most critical is people that would use religion to inflate a picture that they are above and better than other people. Yeah. Right. That to play yeah. out a persona of superiority rather than we are all sinners, meaning mm. we are all deeply imperfect. And the paradox is the more that we can actually accept that the freer yes. we are. And I don't mean by accepting it, meaning we indulge it and say, well, exactly. I'm a sinner, so like, whatever, I'm just going to live it up now. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that we are irresponsible, but that we stop trying to manage our egos and how we're seen and live truthfully, live in line with what is in fact true about ourselves and others. And the thing is, you know, again, I'm I've been asked to teach this lesson on David and Bathsheba. And I think okay. the angle that I want to go on this lesson on Sunday is around this idea that even David, right, is capable of deep sin, right? So even, yeah. and aren't we all sort of David, chosen yeah. and loved by God, but all capable of self-deception, ego aggrandizement, telling ourselves that we're above other people's, you mm -hmm. know, that, that we don't have to live by the same rules. And therefore able to delude ourselves into abjectly harmful things. And so our freedom is in paradoxically staying, being aware of our capacity to mm. do that. That's what allows us to integrate who we are. A house divided is always fragile. And when we refuse to see our darker selves, we are always a house divided. If we refuse to know our darker selves, that doesn't mean you're indulging your darker self, but you yeah. are aware of your capacity that if you refuse to know it, you're not going to want intimacy because your partner will know it and they'll yeah. try to talk to you oh. about it. Jennifer, I don't mean to cut you off on this, yeah. but can I yeah. just share something that but in, sure. in, don't lose a thought, but it's interesting. I've got, and I almost was going to send you this in an email mm -hmm. and Preston Pugmire and I, you know, we have this marriage course and we've integrated this just recently of it's mm. from a book that has strengths, weaknesses. So the strengths, it says light, the weaknesses, it says shadow. So one of them example is that the strength or the light is energetic. And then the weakness or the shadow is exhausting. And I feel like if I look mm. at myself, I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can tell, I, I feel very energetic, but what is my, the mm. shadow of that, or what is what I know people are aware of, I can be pretty exhausting. So is that that yeah, concept yeah. where I have to be able to, okay, I can bring that to light. It doesn't mean that I took look at it like, well, I'm exhausting. That's right. What am I going to do? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Like exactly. So that's true. Like a lot of our strengths have a liability built right into them. Okay. Right. Okay. And no, the, like the thing that. that we are good at is also often got a dark side connected to it. And mm -hmm. the more aware we are of that, again, it's not for the point of berating ourselves and saying we're worthless or anything like that, but yeah, more yeah. I have to keep track of my shadow self so that I am channeling my choices into what is in fact good. Okay. And the more that we can actually accept and know our shadow self, the more trustworthy we are Yeah. because it's not running around controlling us and we refuse to see it. Yes. Oh, I love that. There's another one on the list for confidence that the shadow side of confidence is arrogance. And so sometimes I feel like That's when people right. feel overly confident about their views on everything, if I go back into this emotional yes. maturity or the narcissist I, that field I work with, it, it is fascinating where they're confident that they know more than the therapist. They're confident they know more yeah. than the doctor They're And that yeah. does that they, they are living with, I think that shadow self of arrogance and not willing to confront. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And therefore it interferes. You know, I had a very narcissistic guy show up who is a doctor and he's trying to tell me <laughs> how to do the work. Right. And uh, so I, I was that. saying to him, it's like me showing up and telling you <clears throat> how to do surgery on my leg. Right. Yeah. And I, I said, I feel sorry for you genuinely because you are interfering with the help you need. You're yeah. desperate to be loved. You're desperate to have people to want to be close to you. And yet you are too afraid to let go of what, of the picture that you know everything and that you're in control of everything mm. and you're never going to get what you want. Now, I mean, I remember this narcissistic demanding guy, like his ears, his ears, sorry, <laughs> eyes filled up with tears. <laughs> I don't know what his ears filled up with, but his <laughs> eyes filled up with tears. And he is sort of this moment of being known. 
think I said it better than that than I just said it, but you know, it was like this moment of being recognized and known and that he really was, his shadow was running everything yeah, into okay. the ground. Yes. Yes. And until he was willing to face that and see that he wants to control everything, including his wife that was about to leave him. Yes. He was not going to get anything that he really cared about. Yeah. And so a good therapist or coach or friend or church leader is going to help you see your shadow self, not to make you feel terrible, mm -hmm. but to help you go and sin no more to get stronger. Yeah. So it's when we face our demons that we are able to integrate and choose in a more solid way. And I think that's what spiritual development always requires. Okay. The fantasy that we're all well-intentioned and good, just making missteps in communication and so on, is just fantasy land. Mm. I mean, you don't get Nazi Germany out of well-intentioned people. Yeah. You think about how quickly Putin has been able to mobilize people into evil. Mm. Evil leaders exploit our tendency to self-delude and exploit our desire to be connected to a group to vilify and do harm. We're very, very vulnerable to it as human beings. In the US today, we have groups of people who hate the other group yes. and feel justified because they've been deluded, exploited by media, by leaders mm. into the idea that the other half is different than you. Yeah. Rather than we're all capable of evil. We're all capable of self-deception. Instead of the question of what does the other group understand that I don't yet understand? What does my spouse understand about me that I don't yet understand? If we'd settle down and open up, that's a person that wants intimacy and is yeah. willing to deal with who they actually are rather than asking everybody else to deal with who they are. I love so, I, I like that because that, that makes sense of putting that shadow version or that shadow self in from a society. I mean, that because yes. I, I, boy, did you, this could be a whole other topic for another day even, but I don't know what that was like for you the last couple of years, but I've never seen more polarity come mm. into my office oh, even and then awful. right mm. and then and just and in marriages just yes yeah of... it, it was so mm -hmm. wild and then i felt like it was that okay somebody starts with some sort of cognitive bias then they jump into confirmation bias then they jump into some echo chamber and all they're going to hear is the yeah. things that they feel like they have to hear or yes. else some, for some reason that something is wrong with them and i felt like yes. our, our curiosity just went out the window for a while yes and, yeah. and so much fear which yeah. would make it hard to settle down and understand because you're yeah. terrified. If you understand the other side, you'll give them power and you'll be dead, you know? And so it's yeah. just this, and so, so many limbic people, myself included on some level, mm. to be honest, yeah. you know, of yeah. like, you know, what's happening in the larger conversation that we can't understand each other anymore. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, I think I can give you an amen. That was, well, yeah. that was thank you. But, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but the shadow was so, I appreciate that was so well laid out. And I really am grateful for that. I, okay. Here was the thing I was going to say earlier. And then I can, I, I now I need to let you go, but I really appreciate your time and I could thank mm, you sure. forever. And you're my top three downloads and I'm guaranteeing this will be, you will hit number four and <laughs> Great. like 400 podcasts now. I mean, that you're a big That's deal awesome. and I appreciate that. You come no, on. Thank you. So when earlier, what the thing I was thinking about was I interviewed this forensic psychologist once. And then it was funny because that was one where I feel like, okay, maybe he was a little bit emotionally mature, AKA narcissistic because mm. he thought, he thought I just want to talk to him. I thought we were interviewing for a podcast. We were done. And then he said, Oh, you can't use that. So that was kind of fascinating. Oh. But the details oh. that were amazing was he talked about how after interviewing, I don't know if it was hundreds or thousand or more people for the insanity defense, where he oh. talked about knowing when somebody comes in and they drool and they jump up on the chair and they bark and yeah. stuff that he's like, that guy's not insane. You know, he's playing the role of insane. He's just playing. Insane. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. But then the, but right. then the guy that comes in and he's got the dead stare and he gives some version mm. of the crime he committed that this mm. person has been doing his job for so long that he knows. And I'm so fascinated by, yes. and I feel like in almost everyone's profession, I had a daughter work at Starbucks for a while and she knows, she knows a good, yeah. whatever the, you know, right. Half, she knows how you do it. Yes. And, yeah. and, and I don't. And so I feel like the part that I love about this work and the part I hear coming through in the room for two, and I can only imagine it's in your office is that's the part I feel like that we know, I, I know emotional maturity. I know narcissistic behaviors mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, this differentiation and coaching. And so that's where I feel like it is. It, it just comes across so well. And so go back to that emotional maturity or narcissism or people that are saying, no, I know better. And just, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if you see where I'm going with that. 
But, I'm not uh, quite following your question. Keep going though. I'm yeah, because sure there wasn't one. I think I realized halfway through there, I was saying, I just want to say that I see that you absolutely are so good and know what you do. I want you to validate oh. the fact that I do as well. And then I want to tell all the people <laughs> that are trying to, trying to, you know, that feel like, no, I know better than them that they all need to buzz off. I think that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That's very intimate of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I, now I realize. Now I realize it wasn't even a question. It was back when we were talking about something. I realized that you had mentioned something. And I just I'm so fascinated by that concept of, and maybe that was my own emotional immaturity. Of I used to try to do my bookkeeping. I used to try to do my website, and I realized yeah. that I then I, I went to a QuickBooks conference once. I made it through about an hour, but I'd already spent had the room in San Francisco. So I told my wife mm -hmm. to come on down, and we just. I realized I'm not going to ever know this stuff. So it's really understanding that there are things that we know, things we're good at. And if we don't know them, we're not good at them. Then I guess the maturation process is, is uh, taking ownership of that. Maybe that's where I'm going with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And <laughs> yeah, like part of being wise is knowing what you don't know. Yeah. I remember sitting for the licensing exam and most of it was about knowing what you don't know. <laughs> I mean, mm. like don't <laughs> do harm. Right. And that was kind yeah. of, I remember thinking yeah. like, this is so much less about what you do know and being clear yeah. about what you don't know. So you're not trying to solve problems without competency to solve those problems. And, <laughs> you know, the, the, at least do no point. harm kind of idea. And uh, but yeah. I think that, yeah, it's kind of amazing in life. Like it's really true. The more, you know, the more you realize you don't know. Yeah. Well, I've sometimes had a feeling when I'm learning to do good work of both that I'm getting better at it, but how mm. far I am still from yeah. like, what I mean is it becomes more evident. Like the finish line is like, doesn't even exist anymore where I used to think it did. Yeah. Meaning how one can actually grow within oneself, the ability to be effective in helping other people change is its own thing. It's one thing to see things. But yeah. to know what actually inspires people the right amount. I mean, like there it's just infinite numbers of ways that, that I could get better. Yeah. Um, I do think it's valuable to actually do the podcast because then I'm forced to listen to my own meetings and then I'll be like, oh my gosh, I <laughs> how did I miss that? <laughs> yeah, right. But that's good. That is good yeah. because you can at least step back and see where you're getting manipulated by the client or you're in your own deluded idea about something and missing the cues or whatever. So. Yeah. I love it. I love that. Yeah. And I love that vulnerability. Um, cause I find, I just had a session last week where we've been working under a certain premise with the client and in a couple situation. And now the more that we're working through things, I feel like it's that movie, the sixth sense where we just found out that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. Now we're going back and working through the sessions and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah. This is information the, yeah. that I was missing the whole time. Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And then I feel yeah, like it, it's it, humbling. It, it is humble. And I love that it's humbling. And I feel like the client is both equally appreciative of my honesty and vulnerability, but I feel like there's yes. also a little bit of a, shouldn't you have caught this? Like, aren't you the guy that <laughs> yeah. does the, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm I, sure that's right. Yeah, but yeah. I also do think that I think if you're really genuinely doing your best, as limited as that, as that may be, this yeah. is, I think, true with kids also and your spouse, is that if you are sincerely self-correcting and you really are trying to do right, um, there's a lot of forgiveness for that because even with our kids, even if mm -hmm. you're getting it wrong, but they know you have their interests in your heart, yes. they can track that. And human beings, we just keep on being human. I don't know that we have much way around that, but it, <laughs> but, our <desire, laughs> but our desire to do right by one another is a big deal and certainly not something to be taken for granted. No. Okay. Let me give you one more mm -hmm. a bit of praise because this was one that I think I was able to, I worked into my own relationship. I feel like you've talked about working from a place of trust and, mm -hmm. and I feel like it, it's different than the clients say, what am I just supposed to trust them? And I say, well, no, how could you, mm -hmm. these things have gone on. But I feel like the example that I, yeah. that I had in my relationship and I've, I was able to use your operate from a place of trust. And I feel like it made so much sense was my wife and I having a conversation where she had felt like I was maybe doing a little bit of the gaslighty stuff that I talk about on podcasts. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt like, oh, tell me more. And then she had explained a situation in a way that I showed up. And then I know that that is a way in the past that I did show up more emotionally immature. Mm. And I would have, because I felt my fragile ego was being attacked, that I was yep. trying to defend that fragile ego. And, yep. and I 
man, I was so grateful for that, her saying that, because now I said, oh, now it's needing to operate from this place of trust that I'm aware of that previously exhibited emotional immaturity. So now, yes. you know, in the past, if I was disagreeing with her, it, 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 it was, it yeah, yeah, and it, it was right. because I, I, because how dare you? I'm, I'm no everything. Right. And now if I say, exactly. oh, I don't think that's the case, it still sounds as if I'm the, you know, right. Put, right. it off. Yeah. But now yeah. I'm saying, oh, I, now I'm aware of what I, how I'm showing up. And now I can confidently from a healthy ego say that yeah. I'm, I'm confident that this is a, a that was a view of what mm -hmm. was going on. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. No, it's true. It's really good to be open to what our spouse sees, even yeah. though every cell of my body <laughs> wants to believe they're wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, okay. I will humor you and listen to your view. And then you're like, crap. Oh, I love Dang. that where, yeah, I love when it, when it is like, a, okay, no, that is actually a very good point. Okay. I, you, I will, you know, and I have to not do the, I'll give you that one, but we'll see how it goes next. Uh, one time you got it right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, all right. So well, where yeah. people, people obviously go find you a room for two podcasts, sure. everybody in the world. Needs yeah. To, so you can find everything. You? Yeah. Everything on my website, which is my last name, finlayson fifecom And you can find the room for two podcast. Um, which again is all the couples coaching sessions. You get to listen so in good. and hear, hear yourself through these meetings and see what you can do to make things better. And then I have online courses um, on self and sexual development and relationship development. They're all there. And then just um, conversations like this in my conversations with Dr. Jennifer podcast. So, okay. I love it. Yeah. I do. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on Jennifer. I, I enjoy this so yeah. much. And, uh, and um, I don't know, I just, I really appreciate you taking the time and um, I think it's a guaranteed uh, going to be top four. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's hope or my ego will be. That's right. I, I will tell you it is regardless. I will inflate the numbers from <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. both you and I. Lie okay. <laughs> Okay. Great to see you. All right. Take okay, care, Jennifer. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Okay. Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye.